I want to share something with you this morning out of Nehemiah. It's not in your notes uh, or your outline. You may want to jot this verse down. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. This is speaking from the prophet Nehemiah. And if you know your Bible history, Nehemiah was the prophet that was in charge by God to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem after it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And it was destroyed because of the disobedience of God's people, the Israelites. On Sunday nights, we've been studying the book of Jeremiah from the prophet Jeremiah as he talked about all these things that God had given him to be able to share with the people about all the things that were going to happen. And Jeremiah's job was not easy because if you know your Bible, Jeremiah basically said, you guys are in store for destruction. He brought good news. <laughs> he said, listen, because of your disobedience, there's destruction that's going to come in the form of an attack, in the form of being exiled, in the form of this city will be in ruins. So Jeremiah was the prophet that brought all this good news to the people. And the city was destroyed. Nehemiah is the prophet that was charged with after years of coming back and trying to gather together this place because God's promise would be fulfilled. So we pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1, and again, this is not in your notes. This is all free stuff. It says this, when I heard these things, Nehemiah heard from the Lord about what was going to happen and seeing all the destruction. He says, I sat down and wept. I don't know if anything's ever moved you to the point where it just stops you in your tracks. Some of us have been in those moments where maybe a report came back from the doctor. Maybe that bill comes in in the mail. <laughs> maybe we sit down and have a conversation with those we love about things that are going on in life. Maybe we just turn on the news. <laughs> it caused me to weep. But Nehemiah said, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And this is what I want you to pay attention to in verse 6. He says this, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. To hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. When God comes in such a way to the prophet Nehemiah to be able to say, I am weeping, I am fasting, I am praying before the Lord. That your ear be attentive. Not that God necessarily change his mind. Not that God fixes all the things that are wrong with the world. But Nehemiah prays, I pray that you listen to our prayer. And what does he say? God just fix this mess we're in. God provide the way that will make it comfortable for me. No, he says, I confess our sin. Folks, as we've been talking about this, <laughs> this idea of revival and what it means for us, it, let me just share with you, this, our whole goal this year, back when we met in October of last year as a staff, and we said, okay, we, we bounced around some ideas, we talked, and I shared what I felt like God was laying on my heart, and we talked about this, and we all came to such an agreement. In fact, I've told this story before. It's an amazing agreement when I began to share things, and then Brandon began to share things, and Jim began to share things, and Jennifer and Bob, and we were all sharing things. It was all the same things that God had laid on our heart, and we said, this is what God wants us to do, and we're amazed at how he's going to work this year, and then we start talking about this idea of, of being able to unite together using our theme verse in Ephesians chapter 4 that we as a church, although called to different things, we're going to come together in unity so that we may be built up and be able to experience the fullness of God. So what that means is that we're praying spiritual maturity will happen in your life. 
But it can't happen through us. It happens through what God gives you and what you choose to do in obedience. So the amazing thing about it, church, is that when we see God beginning to move and and change us, revival comes. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had the great privilege of being able to host a prayer gathering, a regional prayer gathering where churches came and, and we understood prayer and we experienced prayer and it was an amazing thing and and we're we're sensing just an anticipation that God is going to do something but we must understand that our responsibility our response as God calls us to and as Bob reminded us is that we respond that we don't just say oh God you are good and you're doing some great things no that means that I have to respond and how do I respond First of all, when we see that God is doing something great, when God is in our presence, that should cause us to say, God, help me to see the sin in my life that I may confess that and repent of that so that we may be able to experience the blessing. And you may know our heart, even though God already knows that, but God wants to hear it. And you know, the amazing thing about it is when we get into this whole idea of what we're doing and, and again, Church, I'm not requiring you to do anything more than to please be obedient. And I can't make you be obedient. You must choose to be obedient to God. But I've called us together to be in a period using this Lent season to just abstain, to stop doing things in our life so that we may be able to focus upon who God is and His presence in our life. And I've called upon three Sundays today and the 22nd and April 5th as days of fasting. A daylight fast from when the dawn comes till the dusk that we fast and focus upon who God is. Because listen, this is not a diet. This is not that, whoo, I'm going to lose some pounds through this, through this prayer challenge. That's not it. Because that's not fasting. That's dieting. Fasting is when we do something to focus upon God, to pray to God, to ask God. Let me tell you, there are some stomachs growling this morning, and let me tell you what to do. Pray. God, I feel the pain, but it's nothing compared to the pain you did for me. God, there are some things that I'm giving up, but it is nothing compared to what you did so that I could have this life. God, I know that even though my stomach is growling, and it is, Although my stomach is growling, God, I know that you're going to do something great because you can handle this pain because you are God above everything. That's what fasting is. So I just want to remind you that as we seek God's presence, because again, revival is this great awareness of God's presence in our life and his asking us to do things. I want to remind you, you'll see it in your bulletins, to pray with me for these things as you continue to seek God, whether you're able to fast completely or not. And as I shared with a number of people and throughout our church information resources, I've said, listen, If you can't fast completely, fast and modify in such a way that you're able to focus upon who God is. Some of us physically and for health reasons cannot do that. So we must be able to understand that God can work even when we submit ourselves to him. So pray for revival. Pray for revival, which is the presence of God manifested in our daily life. Through everything that we do, we see God's presence, which convicts us of who we are and sees the great things that he is. And is doing. We pray for direction, just that we will be able to see where God is working and to join Him. We pray for spiritual growth, helping us to see the things we need to do in our daily life to be able to see God's presence. And we also pray for the unbelievers and for the rebellious. Now, I've put unbelievers and rebellious because I want you to understand something. There are many people, in fact, with a crowd this size, there are probably some of you who do not truly believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never made that choice in your life. And you're here because of family. You're here because of friends. You're here because it's Sunday morning and that's what you're supposed to do. But that does not save you from your sin and allow you to experience the new life that Jesus has brought to us and given us through his example. But there are unbelievers among us. There's also rebellious people. These are the people who choose to disobey. These are the people who know what God's word says, but don't do it. And that includes a lot. But let's be real, church. 
my prayer every single day that I'm going through this challenge with you is that God, don't let me be a stumbling block. So there are times when I'm tired. Listen, when I get tired, my, my kids know, and they'll tell you. They'll testify to the fact, and my wife, that when I'm tired, I'm irritable. <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen when I'm hangry. But I know God's got this. But we're praying for these things. And today I just want to briefly, in the time that we have, talk to you about God's presence in God's word. Because listen, church, if we're going to talk about asking God to do something, we have to understand that he's already done something. And his word is full of his action. His word is full of descriptions of his nature. His word is full of what we can put our trust in. Listen, it's hard for me to believe and trust everything that's in. I mean, somebody walking on water? Come on. Somebody raised from the dead? Come on. We've never seen anything like that in today's time that we didn't attribute to some science that allowed them to be cured. No. But what I know is that there is so much in here I do not understand, but I trust. I trust that God will someday work in such a way that I might understand more. And that's why we come to this point of understanding that God's presence is in God's word. So if we're going to experience revival, we have to be in God's word. We have to understand what it says. We have to read it and not just say, read it, check. Because that's the same thing you do for books when you have those book reports or those reading assignments that all of us love to do. And it's not just in school. Sometimes we have to read. Sometimes we have to read and understand that. I'm constantly reading blogs and articles and things to help me understand and get a better grasp of how to present God's Word to our culture, to know what's going on out there. But I want to just share with you something that's written in our Baptist Faith and Message, and that's, that's not necessarily our creed. That's just the, the information, the, the message of the beliefs that we as Southern Baptists attain to. And I just want to share a portion of this out of there, okay? It says this. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Now, what do all those words mean? It means that we understand that God's word comes from God. We understand that this is a standard of living that we can judge ourselves because it transcends our subjective judgment. What I mean by that is I can choose what I want to do and I can justify it. Well, everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it. Well, it's not going to be that bad, so I can do it. Well, it's not going to matter that much to everybody. We begin to justify. Well, it's on Google, so it has to be true. We can justify. So, therefore, we become our own judge. But what this is saying is that God's word is the supreme judge. It is the standard if we are to call ourselves Christians. Now, let's talk about this church. Let's just be real for a second. Many of us put on the label of Christian, but we do not live Christian. Label of Christian versus living as Christian. It's a different thing in some of our lives. So what do we do? If we're going to expect God's presence to come in our life, we have to understand God's word. And it comes to this point. We have to know that God has given us his word so that we may understand and see and know his presence and how he works. Let me give you some examples in Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, a familiar verse to us says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. For the Word of God is living and active. What does that mean? It means that God's Word is God. 
to be able to live and have life, to be able to know that it's something that we can apply to our life today just like it was applied back thousands of years ago. It's the understanding that we must know God's word is alive in us just like the Holy Spirit that is now residing in us if we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing about it, church, if we do not accept God's word, how can we say we accept God? If we say, well, I'm only going to pick out the New Testament because, you know, that's better able to understand. Because I can't, Sunday, my Sunday night group knows I can't speak Hebrew. I say, just cough and you're halfway there. But what we must know is that God's word is something that can bring God's presence into our life because it is living and active. Another familiar passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says this, All scripture, all scripture is God-breathed. Wow. Just think about that for a second. All scripture is God-breathed. That means that when God spoke his word to the prophets, to the apostles, that they then were able to either speak or write, speak to scribes or write down in such a way that that was not their interpretation of what God was saying. That was not their judgment of what God was saying. That is what God said. Well, how do you know that, Paul? I don't know, prove, me, prove to me that it wasn't. It's a matter of trust. I mean, we can go back and we can see things that were written in the copies. But we don't have original. So if you say, well, I don't know if God wrote that. Well, prove to me that God didn't. Because I'm telling you, I trust what it says because I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And if I accept that, then I must accept God's word. Church, if you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that his blood shed so that you may be cleansed. So that when we have this idea of baptism, that we go into the water and that we come out. It is an act of we are going to death with Jesus, as scripture teaches us. And that we are raised to life like he was. That's from God's word. And if I believe that, I better believe this. And if I believe this, then I better live it. Because if not, then it's just a label. How can God's presence come to just wearing a label? It's like if I was to have all these magazines and, and well, now it's all on an app. But if I had an app, um, you know, where they could just, in fact, they have this. I saw this the other day. It's been a while since I looked at it, but where they can just design clothes for you and send them to you. Now, yeah, it's not free. <laughs> Nothing is. But if I just considered everything that was given to me and all the clothes that I could wear and I could wear the best things that it could ever be and I could wear all these labels that they tell me to wear, that doesn't make me a fashion expert. It doesn't make me, it just means I'm wearing the labels. It has nothing to do with who I am. I try to put on nice clothes because it makes me feel good but folks, let me tell you this. When you wear the label of Christian without accepting what God's word says and living what God's word says, you are just trying to make yourself feel better by wearing a label. Church, we must come to the point that if we are truly going to experience the presence of God, we have to live his word. So three things that I want to share with you real quick. The first one, Scripture is a revelation of God. Scripture is a revelation of God. What does that mean? That means that we are able to know and to see his nature, the way he works, his expectations. As Nehemiah told, um, scratch that. <laughs> I was getting off my notes. We must understand that this is how God reveals himself to us. He manifests or he demonstrates himself to us. He did it in creation when he spoke the word and there was light when he spoke and there was creation. And if we truly believe that, and some people don't, some people say, oh, it's just a big bang. Okay. And some people are okay to trust that, but I don't. I trust in something beyond myself because if I can explain creation, then I must understand how to create. And I'm not going there because God is bigger than I am, as we sing. 
So this idea that we have to do is understand that Scripture is the revelation of who He is. Scripture is how we understand how He works. Scripture is how he, we see His love. Scripture is how I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Scripture is how I know and understand that if I just trust God, He can work through things. He's not going to change circumstances, but He can walk with me through those circumstances. And what we must do is to understand that it's more than just an inspirational work. It is the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of pieces of music that I call inspirational. In fact, some plays, Shakespearean plays, writers, poems, all those kind of things, we think, ah, that's so inspirational because it motivates us. But there was no human dictation or deciphering of ideas. God spoke his word because he wanted us to know who he is. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We must understand that Scripture was not just written by people and prophets and apostles. It was something that God had given so that we may know who God is. Let me ask you this question. How often do you read the Bible? How often when you're stressed do you go straight to God's Word to try to find something that will give you encouragement? When we are confused about things, and let me tell you, I open up God's Word and sometimes I'm confused. God, what do you mean by all of this. And so I just have to ask God, help me to understand more fully. And you know what? Usually when I do that, he does. Why? Because God reveals his nature. And then I begin to know how to live my life because I know God's nature. But it's not just that scripture is a revelation of God, but it's also the presence of God. John 1, 1 says this in this very familiar passage to us. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. The amazing thing about this passage is the Greek word for word that they use here was not only for the spoken word, but also for the unspoken word. The Greeks use this in a way to think that this describes the reason of a person, how they understand things. So it's not just the spoken word, but it's the unspoken word. Whereas the Jews use the word to refer to God. So when we understand this, it's the idea that we understand that word describes Jesus, who is God himself, was with God, so and is God. So we have to understand that God's word is a part of his presence in our life. John 6, 3, 6, verse 63 says this, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Holy Spirit and life. Jesus says, these words I speak are full of the Spirit and life. They are therefore God, because we know that the Spirit is God in His nature. So as we understand this, God's Word, His Scripture, is the presence of God. If we want revival to happen, we must be reading God's Word. If we're expecting revival to happen in our life, we must be a part of God's Word. Why? Because it is His presence. Last thing I just want to share with you is that Scripture is the work of God. Not just the revelation of God, not just the presence of God, but the work of God. Let me share with this with you. In Psalms chapter 19, there's some great Psalms that describe how wonderful God is and his work and his nature. And in chapter 19, it says this in verse 7. Listen to these beautiful words. The law of the Lord is perfect. Oh, we could just stop right there. Let me ask you this, if the law is perfect, as God's word says, if we believe the Bible, if we believe every word that it says, and it says the law is perfect, then why do we not live by it? Why do we not allow God's word to just empower us to do the things that God has called us to do? Why are we so fearful of what other people are going to say when God says, don't worry, be courageous, be strong, I'm going to be with you, take over the land I have promised. Don't fear persecution, because I am going to be there. This is an amazing thing about it. But let's continue. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. 
By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. In verse 14 of that same psalm it says this. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. My rock and my redeemer. Psalms 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This describes this essence of God's word being able to be something that I can trust. Why? Because I know that it's the word of God. I believe that God spoke these words so that I may understand his nature in the revelation of who he is. That I may know that God is with me in the fact that his spirit is within me and that I may know that that God is at work because his law and precepts and decrees are perfect. Why? Because God wants to pour all of this holiness and righteousness into my life, but it will not happen, church, until I understand that God's word is the presence of God. So if you and I are just praying, God, come, God, come, let me see your presence. Let me feel your presence. Some of us today may be saying, God, help me in this time of sorrow. Help me in this time of frustration. Help me in this time that I have. God, just help me to find something that's going to give me hope. What we can know is that God's presence is in God's word. And so we can go and say these words like this. Shout for the joy to God of all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. God's power can come through his word. How often do you read God's word? How, how often do you understand that God is saying that I can have all the power of creation? <laughs> wow, blows my mind. Uh, God, I'm in a desperate place here. There's a lot of things going on with me and I just need something to change. And all we have to do is to read God's word and to know that, uh, that I should not fear. God said he would never leave me nor forsake me. That's in the Old Testament. How am I supposed to live Old Testament stuff? Come on, Paul. That's Old Testament. That's the presence of God. God worked. Let me tell you, the biggest thing about Jeremiah, I remind them every Sunday night. The book of Jeremiah is horrible to read because it's a lot of bad news. Because God's judgment, his judgment and wrath are coming down upon his people. But listen to this. The amazing thing about God's word. When we see God's judgment and we think, oh, God is bad. When all, everybody's like, oh, God is a mean God. No, God's just laying it out there for us to see his standard so that we may be able to repent and turn to him. Every time that we see God's judgment and wrath in, in the scriptures, there is always an opportunity of repentance. And if not, just like we saw in Jeremiah, destruction will come because we are rebelling against God. When's the last time that you've read God's word? Let me close with this. Spiritual growth and discipline come from experiencing God's presence which is revival. And revival will not happen until we experience God's presence, which will lead us to spiritual growth and discipline. Why are we talking about prayer? Why are we talking about revival? Because I pray that every single one of you are able to experience maturity and growing in your spiritual understanding of who God is. So the question this morning may not be, how much do you read the Bible? The question may be is, how much do you really trust in God? How much do you trust in God? How much do you trust? We know that every single one of us here today could talk about all the things. We would have a laundry list of things that you and I go through every single day that we struggle with, that we face, that we fear, that we just don't know what's going to be out there. And how is God going to help me through that, pastor? Because God's presence is in his word. And I believe that if God is who he says he is, then God will provide a way for me to walk through that journey. And in some cases, God can change. Because I believe God's still a God of miracles. Sometimes we just don't pray for miracles. Are you hearing me, church? I believe that God can change people's hearts because we just saw it today. You think, well, those were little kids. Yes, but their hearts were changed because they accepted what Jesus did and they now have new life. Have you done that in your life? Let me just ask you, church, 
There's no way that you're going to experience revival if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. There's no way that you're going to make it through this life in such a way that God intended for you to. Because God has a plan. We know his plans. God knew us before we were even formed. That's why I believe that life happened even before we see the form happening in the body. Are you getting me? So, ah, I better be careful. There's a whole other sermon I could go off and talk about that. Life is precious, but because God intended it to be. And so we must understand that no matter what we face, God has a purpose and a plan because he wants you to experience his presence. He wants you to experience revival. Well, pastor, I'm just not ready for all that stuff because that's going to be some major change. I'm not comfortable with that. I don't even like shaking people's hands. I just don't know if I can do that. I don't ever think I'll raise my hand in church. I said I'd never be a pastor. I said I wouldn't be able to make it. Some of you are saying I'm ready to give up. And what every single one of us need today is an awareness of God's presence in your life. You may think it's insurmountable. You may think it's hard. You may think it's tough. But all you and I have to do is to submit ourselves, surrender, to trust in who God is, to know that his presence is there with us so that we may know that we're going to make it through this. And God's going God's to do something great. It starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can do it just like these kids did. Being able to believe in what he's done to be able to know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Scripture tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved, as it says in Romans. That every single one of us cannot save ourselves because we are all sinful. We all have sinned. And the price of that sin is that we are separated from God. Because of God's wrath, but he offers us his repentance because of his great love that he demonstrated through Jesus, we may have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you can understand and trust that and know that Jesus died for your sins, then you can be saved and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then, where is God's presence helping you to be obedient? By being baptized. Because let me tell you, if you're not following in obedience what are you doing you're rebelling if you're not obeying God you're rebelling against God don't quench the spirit God wants revival to happen in your heart God wants revival to happen in this church don't quench the spirit trust him let's pray together